Today on Uncommon Knowledge, land of the free and home of the vulnerable. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Homeland Security. Is the government doing enough to keep the nation safe? The terrorists behind the 9-11 attack exploited one particular vulnerability in the nation's infrastructure, our air transportation system. Today, experts point to possible other vulnerabilities in other aspects of our infrastructure, our food supply, our ports, the chemical industry, nuclear facilities, more than three years after 9-11, has the government secured these aspects of our infrastructure? And if it hasn't, why on earth hasn't it? Joining us today, two guests. Francis Edwards is director of the Office of Emergency Services in San Jose, California. Stephen Flynn is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of America, the Vulnerable. Former Governor of New Jersey, Thomas Kane, Chairman of the 9-11 Commission, quote, every expert with whom we spoke told us an attack of even greater magnitude than that of 9-11 is now possible and even probable, close quote. An enormous terrorist attack on the United States within, let's say, three to five years. Is probable the word that you would use for that, Franny? Yes. It is. Steve? Yes. Well, let's spend the rest of the show trying to make me feel better about things then. Um, Daniel Byman of the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy wrote an article recently in which he called, quote, we're safer, safer than you think. Uh, let me give the two of you his fundamental analysis and then have you comment on it. The two of you having just said that we're not safe at all. <laughs> the blows against Al Qaeda, he argues, have uh, the biggest blows have been the removal of Afghanistan as a haven and the elimination of Europe and Asia as tolerant environments. The Europeans and Asians are aware of these people now and trying to monitor them and harass them and disrupt their activities. Now let me quote Byman directly. As former CIA director George Tenet testified, successive blows to Al-Qaeda's central leadership have transformed the organization into a loose collection of regional networks that operate more autonomously. That's the end of the, he, he's quoting Tenet, that's the end of that quotation. Now this is Byman himself. This shift from a centralized structure to a more localized one has made the United States homeland safer. The vast sea of disaffected young Muslim men that is present in Europe and elsewhere has no American parallel. Close quote. You buy that? No. You don't buy it at all? I agree with some of what he said, but to say that we don't have an American parallel I think is unfair. If you look at the intelligence that's been collected by American law enforcement, we recognize that we do in fact have people in the United States who are here perhaps for legitimate reasons but have become disaffected or may actually be sleepers. And right here in Santa Clara County, we have targets of concern, persons of interest that we track. Do you have any idea how many people of interest there might be in the country? I don't, but the Intelligence FBI, somebody knows. Do you have any, any idea? No, in fact, we don't know very well. We but, don't. But what we do know is. Do you that, buy his fundamental uh, analysis? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, th th yes, some progress with disruption of Al Qaeda, but I make a more fundamental argument. I argue that what we saw in 9 11, quite simply, is how warfare will be conducted against the United States in the 21st century. That is, every current and future adversary of the United States will make catastrophic terrorism the weapon of choice, as catastrophic terrorism directed at the non military elements of our power the civil society and the critical infrastructure that underpins our power. And I make that case on two basic, I think, observations as a student of military history. The first is we will spend more this year on conventional military capability than the next 30 nations combined. Right. Nobody right. can beat us. Totally, totally you can't. Now, that means there's only two possibilities for the future of warfare. You take this stuff on, <laughs> which is foolish, or you look for a vulnerability. And, and, and the vulnerability turns out to be that our power is based on critical networks of transportation, logistics, and information, and finance, and energy, and intellectual capital. That is insecure. I want to come to all of that, of course. Mm -hmm. 
but I want to push you a little bit on this Byman thesis because what he's saying here is that the uh, work we've done overseas in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and elsewhere, presumably a good portion of this is secret. Who knows quite what, all what's going on? But there's a reason we haven't suffered a terrorist attack during these three and some more years, and it's because by attacking them overseas, we've made it much harder for them to engage in planning and so forth that's necessary to it produce a big attack here in this country. And that's an important point because if that's true, then it suggests that whereas defense is important, Lord knows it's important, and Byman wouldn't suggest otherwise, offense is critical. Well, do you, here's, so how do you come my critique on, on this here. Well, one is we have Madrid, which was a basically, largely homegrown activity on March 2004, four simultaneous attacks within a first world society that had pretty good track record to deal with terrorism and ongoing issues. We had other cases four days after that. One is an issue as a former Coast Guard officer because of the issue of maritime and container security. Four days after, not poorly, report, poorly reported, was a case of Palestinian suicide bombers who hid in a con container with a hidden wall in it. Was when you say container, you're actually, talking about these big, uh, yeah. almost the size of tractor trailers that we see coming into the port of San Francisco, Port of Oakland. That, that that's right. These 40 big, foot by 8 foot by 8 foot objects. boxes that like right. Lego blocks move from a train to a truck to a ship. Okay? Right, gotcha. They, they got one of these going to the port of Ashdog in Israel, and they opened it up. They saw just a wall, so they closed it. These guys burst out when they got on the terminal, ran for the tank farms to blow it up. Now, they were intercepted by Israelis. They blew themselves up and killed eight Israelis at the same time. Right. They didn't get their target, but this was different. This wasn't a cafe. This wasn't a wedding. This wasn't a commuter bus. This is the use of the transportation system as a means of right. terror and targeting infrastructure. And I think that was... We'll turn in a moment to the question of responding to terrorist attacks, but first, the matter of protecting ourselves against them. Steve Flynn in his book, America the Vulnerable, I quote him to himself, with the exception of airports, much that is critical to our way of life remains unprotected, close quote. Now, I'd like to just run down as a layman pieces of the American infrastructure and have the two of you professionals comment on them. In the first place, you say, with the exception of airports, what are we doing right about airports? On a specific scenario, what was confronted on 9-11, which is people getting aboard with box cutters and, and hostage planes, we fixed that probably actually by locking the cockpit door and changing the behavior of passengers, the expectations of passengers. Okay, so what we're doing right at, with airports is that what happened on 9-11 isn't going to happen again. Well, it's pretty... Not exactly the way it happened on 9-11. Right, right. But now, what's limited even there, though, is, of course, we sit on the top deck of the plane. The bottom decks of most passenger planes, about 60 percent of them carry air cargo. And the only thing that airlines do with air cargo is weigh it. They don't inspect it. There are 100 total inspectors in the United States Federal Transportation Security Administration dedicated to looking at air cargo security versus the 40,000 that check passengers. The problem, it, it illustrates a broad issue, which is that we're not thinking systemically about this issue. Okay, let, me, let me take down food time. supply. Are you happy with the American food supply? You know, our, our food supply is a kind of a cradle to table problem. So from the moment that it's planted, we know that people could bring a crop duster and spray something inimical on the material as it was growing. It can be interfered with in shipment. It can be interfered with in the grocery stores. It can be interfered with in the distribution center. But we have a challenge because we want to remain an open society. And we want to maintain a society where we have free trade. So as long as that's one of our goals, then we have to constantly balance what kind of additional costs are we going Absolute, to place right. on the food and what kind of interference with the um, distribution patterns are you, we going to tolerate? You write a lot in your book about the chemical industry. Right. Tell me what you're frightened about there. Well, what I'm frightened is we have about 15,000 chemical facilities in this country, and many of them deal with the most deadly stuff we've ever devised on the planet, because, but they have commercial applications, industrial applications. Right. And yet today we don't have any effort at the federal level to investigate whether there's adequate security at these industries because we haven't agreed on what those standards are and there is in fact no federal review process of this is legislation still more well now is, no, no, is no. there no incentive for the commercial enterprises themselves to make sure they have very good security it, it turns out i argue that there is not that this is one of the myths i think is that there's sufficient market incentives for the private sector to protect itself well, I, 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 I make what about tort law say somebody has a big above ground facility that holds a lot of some horrible acid and there's used in a terrorist attack can people sue them for inadequate uh, protection? It, it, it is potential, but I think most companies would probably just make the calculus they're out of business anyway. So what, what you have, though, is a classic, it's a tragedy of the commons problem, we call it here, which is or free rider issue. Mm -hmm. No single entity, whether the chemical industry or the transportation or the food industry, owns the whole infrastructure. Right. Security has baseline costs. 
if they do it themselves voluntarily raise the bar that a couple of things happen one is their profits obviously affected because they're raising costs if the competitors are not the bad guys go to the weak point because it's critical it's all interconnected it gets shut down when the government responds and then Congress weighs in afterwards and comes with nifty ideas of how to fix it that may look nothing like your initial investment. Okay. All so, that means is that with three years, we have the data on this now, three years we've seen virtually no investment by the private sector in protecting the most critical elements of our power. And you want... Stephen says that private industry is doing almost nothing to protect us. What exactly does he want the government to do instead? Your answer to that is to involve the federal government. In, in no, what way? Yeah. To create, well, for example, mm -hmm. let's take the yeah. chemical industry. You yeah. said we have 15,000 installations. Yeah. And what do you want to do? Create a big new federal police force? Or do you want to have Congress mandate that certain materials must be handled in certain ways? In other words, there are all kinds of yeah. levels yeah. of, yeah. of yeah. What, what I really want is a really effective. Or you could presumably even tweak the tort law to make it sure, to make it very clear to people in the, in the marketplace that they've got to spend more on and, l and let the marketplace, so to speak, handle the problem. How, how, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really a mixture in part, but, but really it's a real private-public partnership, which is what we don't have today. The, see, the challenge we have is a private sector who owns 85-plus percent of this infrastructure actually knows its vulnerabilities better than anybody in the U.S. Right, government, because right. there's no expertise. But the, the private sector, because of this tragedy of the commons problems, can't impose this across an industry itself because they're competing with one another right so what you need is the private sector come in and say these are the standards we all can agree upon but they have to become standards we can find mechanisms whether it's tort law or insurance to allow right. to enforce this but it will ultimately have to be a public role that sounds so good the to public you. government is that a good model for food supply because look this yeah. line of argument creeps very easily or it, let's put it this way it lends itself into a vast expansion expansion of federal authority, regulatory authority. So how do you solve that? How do you address that, that problem in this layman's mind? Say, if I'm thinking it, a lot of people are worried about it. I think we are looking at a cost-benefit issue. Right. And we need a really good threat analysis. And that's what we've been trying to do at the local government level over the last several years. How do you, in San Jose, analyze your threat? How on earth can you measure the likelihoods, the probabilities? How do you do it? Well, fortunately, I don't have to. Our police intel officers do that, but okay. they do it based on the likelihood of an event occurring, uh, the numbers of people that are likely to be willing to perpetrate the event that would have something to gain from it, uh, the cost of somebody doing a certain type of action. And then we try to look at those things that are, first of all, most likely to occur, and second of all, would have the largest negative impact on our community and focus our efforts in that direction. Okay, so she has just armed me to right. come back at you mm -hmm. with a slightly different, with a slight a twist on the question. Sure. Um, I don't know much about ports. Actually, I don't know much about any of this, but, but the example I have most clearly in my mind because I have to take my shoes off every time I go through is the airports. Right. Now, so the response of Congress and the President, Bush, after 9-11 was to federalize the security, so TSA, what does TSA stand for? Transportation, Transportation Security. Okay, so they invent a new federal thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if you're talking about security being a private good, yeah. isn't that exactly the wrong way to go? Shouldn't you in instead invite competition from a dozen or maybe a dozen dozen security firms to compete for contracts and compete for quality? And indeed, let United Airlines compete against Delta, against Northwest, saying, look, mm -hmm. we do a better job in, of inspecting luggage. Shouldn't, shouldn't you push this into the marketplace instead of bringing it into the, into the federal it, it, it clearly is a, a match between the two because transportation lives and dies by standards. The planes have to come in and out of airports. You can't have different rules in every seaport around the world. So there is a need for setting standards. That's how you're right. And that has to be done by the feds? No. I mean, well, oh. it, 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 it needs the support of the state. The, the industry can you develop think I'm making a good argument, don't you? <laughs> well, I think you're making an interesting argument, but the problem Ooh, is we oh had, is that. Oh, <laughs> we had private uh, security at the airports before 9-11, and they were minimum wage people who were hired on a low bid basis by the airlines. And so the result was we didn't have a very good level of security, and the people who were doing the security work often had limited English competency, so their ability to communicate their concerns with the passengers was also limited. One of the goals of TSA was to set standards, quality right. standards, for the type of people... Surely you could have done that without federalizing the whole 
uh, industry. Well, right? I, I, I think not at the speed with which they want it. Oh, to really? Do it. Yeah. You really, you're both well, by the well, making TSA a federal point, operation. But, but here, was here's a, a good different idea. model. Here's a different model that right. we're trying to do in the seaport because it's much more complicated here because we're talking about international now. Sure. All right. And an example of this is, uh, you know, I met in Singapore with 90 percent of the ocean carriage industry, and there was not a single American in the room but myself. Okay. As you're making the case then, but here is here's what we're looking there. I call it the Green Lane approach. It's like the Green? Easy Pass system okay. right. that we use for uh, on toll collection. Right. Now. Right. The Green Lane would be to say, if you use a smart box, a, a container we can track, with a birth certificate, somebody's authorized, uh, that, that would basically validate what's in here is legitimate, that gets vetted. And there's that some costs, technological overhang. We have a ship in or something. Yeah. Okay. All okay. Right, go ahead. And it costs you $50 a shipment to do this. We're going to give you something in return. The things in return is, if we decide to target you for inspection, we're going to do you first. If we raise our alert levels, we're not going to mess with you because you've already done everything we need up front. And finally, if we turn the system off because of an event, we're going to start with you first. And then what happens here is then the port can build the infrastructure for it because it knows this customer is right. going to come because $50 for the insurance of not having a terrorist event shut down the system looks pretty attractive right. given the alternative, which is gridlock. Right. There's a way of using, but that can't happen. I mean, the CEOs tell me that can't happen. The term offers, unless, the feds. unless the feds come in and say, as a policy, the way we approach okay. this is that way. So it's a mix of... Now, just how prepared are we to respond to terrorist attacks? Matthew Brzezinski, quote, Rarely, if ever, are first responders all called on to do their jobs at the same time and on a massive scale that taxes all their resources, whether that means handling hundreds dead or injured, marshalling dozens of ladder companies at once, or summoning an entire city's supply of ambulances. Such efforts require careful coordination and almost military precision and rapid reaction, close quote. And yet, he goes on to say, that only in a very small handful of our biggest cities do large-scale exercises take place? How come? Well, we're back to the threat analysis again. A community has to look at its day-to-day -day operations and determine how much of its scarce resources it can reasonably dedicate to emergency response versus libraries, schools, or something else. Obviously, if you're hit, you want a rapid and efficient response. That, that's clear. But is response in some way also a defense against getting hit in the first place? That is to say... Hardening the target. Well, that's our the theory. Well, but if you're a terrorist and you say, well, we're not going to go to San Jose because anything we do there will have much less impact because they're so good at handling whatever we intend to throw at them, we'll go... Is that a, a right way to think about it? Well, well I think it certainly is one of is One is just as a practical matter, that some prudent measures we take at the local level can make the difference between tens of lives being lost or thousands of lives. That's right. just classic emergency preparedness thing. Public health like hurricane issues, right. So forth here. And in many cities, uh, in many urban areas, are very frail systems to do handle catastrophic events. That, that's just a reality. So we would save lives by having this capability, and it would be multi-pronged right. you know, multi beyond just terrorism. But also, yes, the broader case I would make is that when, by building defense, which is both protection and response capabilities, right. you t make ter catastrophic terrorism a less attractive means of warfare. There's not a huge bang okay. for your buck. You mentioned scarce resources. Um, are you happy with the resources that you have? The difficulty that we have at the local government level is that the federal legislators who are providing most of the funding at the present time for the counterterrorism, anti-terrorism, terrorism preparedness world are for the most part very unfamiliar with local government and they seem to think that providing us money to buy more equipment is the answer to our problems when in fact the answer to our problems is providing better training for the personnel that we have. Training is, a, is also money though, isn't it? Or right, but when they, for example, we right now have a $9.9 .9 million urban area security initiative grant. And this- Who's a grant from whom? Who gives From that? the federal government. The federal. Yes, okay. the, the uh, 50 largest urban areas in the United States have okay. been given these grants. And right now the money is allowed to be spent for planning, exercising, training, equipment acquisition or operations. Right. And it's at the discretion of the locally elected officials how they want to allocate these right. funds. But there's a proposal in Congress right now to limit to 10% the amount of money that we can pay for overtime for training. And these kinds of limitations are foolish, and okay. actually this one's in the wrong direction. So here, here we have the usual stupidity, right? In other words, we can, argue, we can say right now, I think that both of you would agree with this, that when it comes to rapid response, the correct locus of authority is local, right? 
and that if money does indeed have to get raised at the federal level, the spending decisions, to the greatest extent possible, should still be left in local hands. You'd well, agree with that? I, I, I agree. I You're agreeing with that, right? Well, yes. Well, okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's where the expertise and capacity come. But it is resource. And what we know, I mean, here is the end. It's a real challenge. Every reasonable person that has looked at this issue over the last five years says the threat is real and the, ca the, ca the impact would be terrible on right. community should it happen. The people who are going to respond in the first 24 hours are all going to be local. Everybody who's looked at what local capacity is to deal with a catastrophic attack says it's not good. Why this breakdown? It's three and some years after 9-11. Everybody gave you that quotation from Tom Kane, yeah. uh, who said every, all the experts think another one is on its way. And then we all sit here and agree that at the local level, we don't have what we need. Mm -hmm. Why the disconnect? It, it is because of the, we haven't had a federalism conversation in this country. The federal government has basically said categorically, our money is only used for military and border security, and states and locals and the private sector should take care of themselves. Why shouldn't they take care of themselves? Because they can't. In, in the, in the immediate Why future, not? They, Why should in, California, in, in which if theory, it were its own economy, theory, would be the theory, seventh biggest in, in the theory, country? Because yes. it has a huge deficit, which it has to balance each year. And, if it and the feds deficit, don't have a big deficit? They do, but the feds can get away with it. And we're going to get... Last topic, how do we make sure that government efforts to protect us don't threaten our very way of life? I've quoted Tom Kane, who was chairman of the 9-11 Commission. Let me quote you another member, Richard Benveniste, quote, the authority of government must be tempered in these circumstances by an enhanced system of checks and balances to protect the personal liberties that define our way of life, close quote. What checks and balances can you offer to offset new federal authority, spending measures, and so forth. And the same measures we always use, which is one, things like inspector general functions here, greater oversight, civilian oversight boards, which we do in the intelligence community and so forth. My, my, my issue is that to balance this act between our security and liberties is if you give the government more authority, which it does need for this kind of threat than what it had before, then you raise the accountability bar. And you raise the accountability bar by, 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 by putting in place the same things as the nation of rule of law we always use. Uh, in these other areas, make sure power isn't uh, 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 that that we don't misuse the power, and, and therefore erode <laughs> ultimately public confidence in our institutions. And that's why my main thrust is: it, it, I'm not worried about what the terrorists can do to us as much as we can do to ourselves. The fact is, post-national traumas, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, is not the time we have the most level heads. Right. I can't guarantee we'll keep a level head next after the next disastrous attack. So, but if we don't make prudent investments and we lose public confidence, the certainty of overreaction is almost guaranteed. Not just exclusively. Franny, what's your answer to this question or the concern that that responding to terrorism leads almost inevitably to growth in government, government power and so forth? Well, I think that we've seen a consolidation of government agencies in the Department of Homeland Security, and it will remain to be seen whether that leads to a growth or whether it how, leads to how a do you, will you see the creation of this gigantic new federal bureaucracy, the department, in, uh, I should say, by the way, to be fair, it's not as if it were created out of nothing. It put this it's bureaucracy, a merger. It's a merger, right. right. Okay. W let me ask you this. Does that make you feel safer, better, that there is now a Department of Homeland Security? No, it actually was a great disappointment to me because FEMA was an outstanding partner for us at the local FEMA government the level, federal, federal Emergency Management Agency. And they worked with us on an all-hazards approach to disaster preparedness, which is the only approach that's financially sustainable and that's sustainable from a political perspective. And they got swallowed. And they by got swallowed. Security. So I'm just hopeful that they will be able to, now that their ability to respond to the hurricanes in Florida has been analyzed, and Department of Homeland Security seems to have developed a respect for FEMA and their capability. I'm hoping that they may be able to have a stronger voice in the way the Department okay. of Homeland Security develops in the future. Last questions of the show. Um, five years from now, will we be as good at security in our ports, at least as good in, at security in our ports as we are in our airports? That is to say that we will have addressed the, the most pressing security issues. What do you think, Fran? I think the ports, as Steve's pointed out, are a much different challenge because of the multinational nature of the commerce. And in addition, once the materials arrive here, they go into commerce in different levels. 
some of its raw materials, so some it's of hopeless, its finished So it's hopeless, so we goods. will have grappled no, with it? No, but I, I think the time is going to be longer than what it took oh, you to do? turn the airports overnight. No, no, I, 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 think, I, I think that the merging of the private sector desire for supply chain visibility, transportation asset visibility, and the security impar imperative for greater policing capacity in the system here can merge in, in very quickly. If the government you're hopeful that policy, it will. Without a huge cost. I understand. So what I'm asking now yeah. is for the two of you as professionals, what you hear, what you feel, do you... Are things coming together? Are you hopeful, well, I, or do you feel yeah. as though you're screaming and beating your fists against a brick wall? Well, it, it's it's tough. It's a tough road on a lot of these critical infrastructures to get the action we need. And I think we're still seduced into thinking that if we can just take them out over there, somehow this will go away. I'm all for offense. So that is a, that is a snare and a delusion. This notion it, it, that it, offense. It is. It's part of the solution, but we need overall resilience. There is strength not just in being able to throw a punch, but being able to take a punch. And when you look at uh -huh. the Brits' model for being able to deal with the V bombs during the Second World War right. and terrorism with IRA, it was the resilience of the society, the resilience of a Maggie Thatcher they could to take, take a, a hit. We, if we have no ability to do this here and people lose confidence in their government, that's where we get in the most dangerous scenario. So Are you we could all be in one group. Well, I think what Steve just said is the reason why local government emergency preparedness for all hazards is so critical because we can't prevent disasters from occurring. Right. But what we need to demonstrate as a local government is that we have the capability to respond to the essential needs of the community. Are you hopeful? Do you think it, as a professional, you attend conferences, you talk to your peers in other cities and so forth, are people getting their acts together in a way that pleases you? I think we're much better off now than we were on 9-11, and I think in five years we'll be better than we are today. All right. Franny, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.